Hello, my name is Bill Sawicki, Managing Editor of Healthcare IT News, a HIMSS Media publication. Welcome, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Improve Operational Efficiency and Patient Engagement with Robotic Process Automation, sponsored by Cydias Tech. Robotic Process Automation, RPA, has been generating strong interest and its impact in the healthcare technology space is likely to be significant with the potential to accelerate processes, drive greater efficiencies, and improve patient engagement. Today you will learn about how RPA can help address specific healthcare challenges and hear about leading RPA tools, technologies, and methods. Our speakers today are Manisha Bafna, Assistant Vice President of Consulting at Cydias Tech, and Catherine Calarco, Senior Director of Industry Strategy and Marketing for Life Sciences at Automation Anywhere. With that, I'll hand it over to Manisha to begin the presentation. Thank you, Bill. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, this is Manisha Bafna, and I thank you, Bill, for the introduction. Uh, so I have about 18 years of experience uh, in the IT industry, which includes a lot of healthcare technology and consulting. Uh, a lot of knowledge on payer provider and patient engagement. So uh, my core area of expertise includes uh, consulting on adoption of latest technology trends uh, with respect to health systems, managing the healthcare regulations, looking at latest trends such as RPA, artificial intelligence, cloud, and how do you bridge the gap between these technology trends and uh, the healthcare health systems, right? And I have a bachelor's degree in electronics engineering, and I am looking forward to today's discussion on how is RPA, you know, catching up in the healthcare space, and what is the way forward for organizations to adopt RPA in their business context. Thank you. I'll pass it on to Catherine for her introduction and covering up the slides. Hello, good morning or good evening, wherever you are. I welcome you to this webinar. It's our honor to be presenting to you, and it's our goal to talk about patient engagement and how we can reduce friction and increase value for both customers, patients, and stakeholders. And we're seeing across the uh, world how RPA and intelligent automation is delivering outcomes and enabling better wellness and well-being worldwide. I am Catherine Calarco. I'm Senior Director at Automation Anywhere, and I have over 20 years' experience, including uh, organizations like Applied Biosystems and also consulting with MIT around the world. And I oh, love innovation, and I love being able to recognize the value of it and being able to deliver that to uh, people globally. So it is our, uh, today what we're going to cover is we're going to deal with how to, um, we're going to focus on the basics of RPA, typical use cases in healthcare. We're going to cover things like uh, how, how to get started, um, what is the current RPA market in healthcare, some use cases, so basic real-life examples of how to make this work, and some of the key success factors in selecting an RPA tool, and also how to actually implement it within your organization. So just get started. Um, it's uh, one of the things that's super important. Now, I don't know. Some of you may be starting on your journey with RPA, and some of you may actually have already started to uh, do pilots or are very experienced. But the idea is that uh, we want to be able to enable you from lab to market uh, to automate thousands of processes. And we've seen that with the top 20 life science companies and also from very small organizations to very large organizations. And intelligent automation works as basically software uh, takes over manually, manual, highly repetitive tax tasks. And what it does is it will think uh, as a person in terms of being able to evaluate a particular document, and it will then uh, uh, act and, as being able to put information from a spreadsheet into um, a particular form, and then it will analyze that, the bots for you and keep track of what they're doing. Um, so the, uh, on here you can see that the, uh, as an overview, uh, basically, it's an entity which is capable of program being programmed by a computer to do what a person does. And the intention is not to actually take away roles, it's actually to convert roles into higher value tasks. 
so you can focus on being able to improve the, um, the experiences that people are, are, are engaged with your organization or within your um, product or services. Okay, so uh, it basically RPA mimics human behavior and takes away some of the very manual tasks. What we've seen with outcomes with organization includes things such as uh, reduced cycle time, improved customer experience and satisfaction. Companies are seeing over 50% improvement in their customer experience and satisfaction. We see reduce of costs and increase of productivity. In a recent poll, people have identified that what, they've, what the number one value they're trying to do is convert their employees into higher value work. So they are able to both increase the top line, uh, decrease the cost of operation, and improve the efficiency within how patients are engaging with their organization. So here's an example of how it works. So you can see here that uh, what in a manual task, there's a lot of human touching of the claims, right? So you, um, the RPA can open files, it extract data from the documents, it can send emails and input data into forms. All automatically. You also can have an individual who can um, review it and to QA it and then or, or trigger the next steps. So the goal is to create, rather than a person taking maybe five days to complete a process, the bot can do it in less than uh, two hours. And so you see a huge improvement in cycle time. You see a, uh, a reduction in error rate because when the bot actually manages the claims process, as you can see that on the bottom of the slide, it, can, it basically does it the same way every time, so it's 100% accurate in that particular um, process. But it's set up based on your business rules, and if there are any issues or exceptions, it can send it to a person to evaluate. And it can do this 20 by 7, and so therefore, it doesn't need to take coffee breaks, and, um, and it uh, can keep working for you 24 by 7 or 20 hours a day um, if there's an update cycle in the middle of the night. So this is a very important aspect of RPA, and what it can do for you in order to take away some of these uh, processes and what would it may what would it do for your business if you're able to process claims we see organizations very large healthcare organizations that are now automate a bot is basically filing the claims from the pharmaceutical company into the provider and uh, they, the provider actually doesn't even know that that's, the bot is doing it. And there's 100% accuracy, uh, very reduced cycle time, and improved uh, patient care and, uh, and experience. Okay, so now we're going to ask a few uh, questions of you. We want to get a sense of how you're thinking about uh, RPA. We'd love you to just take a moment and, and answer this. Within your organization, when you're thinking out processes that you can automate, Think about ones that are very highly repetitive, that are very manual, that your team spends a lot of time doing, where the data is maybe uh, structured and the process is done the same way every time. What we want to do is go ahead and take, uh, sorry, I, the technology moved forward. Um, go ahead and identify how many processes in your organization are eligible. Okay, you can see that you've got, most people have not measured it, so there's a huge opportunity to identify uh, um, where, which ones you want to, and I know that Manisha is actually going to be dealing with that. So, um, and uh, so you see one to 10, 23% of you say that there's a, at least 10 processes in your organization. You have 19% um, see that there's about 20, and majority of you have not measured it. So there's a huge opportunity, and Manisha will cover how you can measure and what your discovery process in order to identify processes and create a pipeline for automation. Okay, so what is the value? Um, what we're seeing within uh, life sciences and healthcare organizations is that uh, they are being able to uh, achieve ROI within less than a year. They also are able to have cost savings, you, typically between 20 and 60% of uh, your baseline FTE. We are also identifying 100% or nearly accurate, and when it's not accurate, there's a process that can actually manage that for you. It's done the same way every time. Also reliable and, and meets compliance standards. We have had one organization or two large pharmaceutical organizations that have done an audit of their processes and have met their FDA and compliance and safety um, standards and quality standards, which is very exciting for them. And they also see an increased speed and productivity. And this is not just across healthcare and life sciences, it is across all industries. 
Okay, so I've got another poll question for you. I'd love to hear from you. What, according to you, is the best part about RPA? So in terms of the benefits that we just covered, what do you feel is the most important? Is it the fact that it's non-invasive, that it's easy to learn and implement? You can handle multiple applications and workflow. It can be orchestrated. And this is the questions that Citrus Tech has, is interested in finding out from you and our audience in terms of how, uh, how you're actually dealing with this. And what do you find valuable? Oh, great re responses coming in. Excellent. So just going to wait a few more minutes and go ahead. Now we've got a good portion of the audience. Feel free to click on those and let us know. So let's show the poll results. Excellent. So I, we see this consistently, the fact that it can handle multiple applications and workflows. We see that it can work within dis different systems, pulling uh, information out of one system and entering it into another. It can search multiple databases, including things as easy as um, your SharePoint drives. We've seen people use Excel spreadsheets, even Word documents, PDFs, and integrating it into things like SAP your, um, and, uh, and other systems that you're running within your organization. It's also that it can be orchestrated. One of the key things that is important for our, our organizations is that it's secure and that it's controllable. You actually have a, um, a we have our a product automation anywhere called Bot Insights, and, and also customers create and monitor via the contr control center. So they use these two tools together to create a, a global command center, which uh, reviews all the bots and the operations. So you don't have rogue rogue bots being built and you create a, a uh, audit and compliance and governance process out of your center of excellence to actually uh, ma manage the systems. It is highly secure. Obviously, that is a very important aspect for all of us. So those are great responses. Okay, now um, I think most of you may be aware of what's happening in the industry trends. What we're seeing is major challenges within the life sciences and healthcare industry. You know, there's decreasing margins, there's higher uh, safety and pharmacovigilance costs. There's a lot more uh, demand to be able to pr provide uh, uh, outcomes associated with both uh, the care and the changes within the hospital system itself. So um, I want to cover some of these industry trends. So you, um, what we're seeing within life sciences and healthcare is that there's over a billion uh, dollars in revenue and funding is actually going into RPA, and 40% of enterprises have adopted an RPA tool by, by 2020. So there's over 80% growth in this market in terms of uh, adoption of RPA. So it is being recognized as a, a necessary tool in order to innovate within your organization as well as being able to provide the value or uh, meet the mission that you're trying to do with regard to cost management and care. So um, you're going to see over 20 to 50% cost savings. You're in going to increase your FTA capacity and also reduce healthcare tasks. The applications that we see most adopted are claims administration, member management, provider management, health and care management, and administration. We see, see things as simple as you know, your IT systems or HR and as complicated as a complaint handling. Well, I also see organizations that are tracking surgical instruments from end to end to assure inventory is available uh, when it's needed for surgery and also that costs are managed within that uh, portfolio. Even things like updating labels are done by using OCR uh, and uh, our, our intelligent automation system to take the uh, cycle time down from uh, eight weeks to one week. So there's a major opportunity to see improvements that both uh, address the top line and also the bottom line. And the whole goal is to actually create better care worldwide. It's our, our administrative and our task here is to actually uh, enable that. Now, Within the life sciences, we talked about a few of the uh, use cases that we're seeing across organizations. We have very specific uh, case studies and also process diagrams and flows, and we welcome the opportunity to talk with you about data and document collection and submission, patient engagement, things like how do we incorporate our IQ bot with your chat to enable both better information being served to your health professionals or to your uh, patients and caregivers. There's also, um, we get customer feedback and, uh, and well, surveys are done or couponing and other issues with regard to life sciences. 
We also obviously have a big amount of pharmacovigilance research and research studies. Uh, so at that point, I'm going to hand over to Manisha um, and just uh, to cover the rest within the providers, payers, and uh, the medical technology. So over to you, Manisha. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, this is, that was a good overview on RPA and the trends around RPA. And, uh, you know, just moving on to the next slide, uh, which is, you know, I, I just, what I would want to cover is, um, you know, so, you know, from an opportunities perspective, as uh, Catherine was mentioning, right, so we're seeing uh, applicability or trends of RPA in almost all the spaces around providers, payers, uh, you know, life sciences, medical technology, uh, whether it's optimizing your existing applications where you would want to, you, you're identifying repeatable processes and you think there are areas where, uh, you know, it can be improved or optimized uh, so that, uh, you know, the teammates, the organization is focusing on bigger, uh, you know, bigger programs, bigger business initiatives, right, and not really working on repeatable processes which could be automated, right? So uh, in that context, you know, I I'm actually wanted to move to the next slide. There's slight technology uh, hindrance here. Perfect, yeah. So uh, maybe there's a lag on my side. So how do you identify uh, what should be, what what is a good RPA candidate, right, when, when you are, as an organization, whether you're a payer or a provider or a life science organization, right, or a product company, how do you identify what is what is the business process or, or health system process which is uh, eligible for RPA? So we've tried to, you know, list down some six to eight parameters based on which we think that an organization can think of identifying the right RPA, right processes which could be RPA candidate. So you know, for example, decision making, right? So if you have a certain business workflow, for example, you know, uh, Catherine was covering the claims, uh, the claims processing use case, just when she was uh, talking about RPA at an overview level, right? Uh, the process involves a standard, uh, you know, a rule-based mechanism where the, user, the users are looking at a claims form, they're identifying who the patient is, they know that the data needs to be filled into the claims data entry, and then an email needs to be sent to the patient that, okay, you know, we have received your claim and we are processing your claim. Now, this process is a standard process, and it is standard rules or standard processes, right? So there's not much of human intervention required to, you know, make any specific judgment-based decisions. Versus look at a process where the claim is rejected, and now, uh, let's say a patient has reached out uh, as a query and has a query that okay you know why my claim got rejected now that will require some kind of judgmental decision that okay we need to respond to the patient what were the what were the reasons why the claim was denied so that is not a candidate for rp but the initial use case is a candidate for rp so that's an example where you decide on you know what is if it's a rule based standard rule based um, process go for it implement rpa uh, and in that context, right, if you're, if you're uh, basically you're filling up a form, there is a standard structured data that you're inputting, which has, which is digitized, right, which has an electronic format, it is standardized, right, then then you can, you know, definitely look at that as a candidate for RPA. And then you know that that is a process over time that has been repeatable, nothing has really changed, right, then that could be a candidate for RPA. Similarly, you know, from an administrative management perspective, let's say filling up payroll times or timesheets or, you know, any other administrative task involved, right, which are done at a centralized level. Again, a candidate for RPA if it is a standard process. Uh, similarly, there are frequent errors and we know what are the standard troubleshooting mechanisms and how a, a human would react to those errors. Again, a candidate for RPA, but if there are rare errors and it requires somebody to take a decision that, okay, you know, now what do we need to do to change the process? Not an RPA candidate. And as I mentioned, right, if it is repeatable, continuous, doing the same thing over and over, definitely a candidate for RPA. And the reason I'm saying that is, right, look at the cost of, you know, managing those operations for repeatable processes, standard stuff, right? Um, you, you need to look at those processes. You also need to do uh, an ROI analysis 
what is the return on investment? For example, for a bigger organization which is probably managing 100,000 claims or is probably, you know, is a large hospital, you know, uh, managing another, you know, 100,000 patients, right? For them to automate a claims uh, standard input process or to automate standard patient registration details is definitely an ROI. But if I'm a small practice where I have four to five, uh, you know, uh, locations, uh, very small uh, practices, four to five physicians uh, maintaining that practice, then, you know, I may still want to do the process manually. I will not get an ROI out of, you know, automating my patient registration process. So that, that suitability is also important when you're looking at uh, the selection for eligible processes. We, moving on to the next slide. Uh, you know, while uh, while you decide on what your selection criteria is, right, we thought of listing down overall use cases, right? So I gave a few examples, but what we've done is we've listed down potential use cases uh, in the healthcare space, right, where we think RPA could definitely be uh, uh, applicable, right? So just... You know, we've listed down certain use cases, and just a disclaimer that, again, right, as I mentioned, depending on the size of the organization and suitability, right, these use cases may be applicable based on the ROI that the organization is looking at. For example, new patient registration. So typically we know there are standard uh, input data that you put in uh, for the patients. You're capturing demographic details. You're capturing their insurance details. Uh, you're part of a network, so you already know what are the certain uh, insurance companies that are going to be shown up in the demographic form, right? Definitely, it could be a use case that can be, you know, automated up to a certain level. It could be an attended board. So just in the RPA context, right, you have uh, supervised bots and you have unattended bots, right? So that is also a criteria that you can look at when you are actually configuring the bots, whether you need an attended bot or you need an unattended bot. The difference is unattended bots, they don't really need any kind of manual intervention at all, right? 100% running without any intervention, don't need coffee breaks, the process is still running, correct? Uh, there are some bots, right, which need to be supervised based on how you are, uh, how the bots are uh, being trained and, you know, whether there is maybe not a complete judgment-based decision-making, but there is some slight manual intervention that is required. You could definitely still implement an attended bot, but you may need some manual interventions. Similarly, appointment scheduling, again, you know, in context of practice management systems, large hospitals, you know, managing the appointments, workload, specialties, rescheduling of appointments, you know, care coordination, sending reminders to patients for picking up their prescriptions, for scheduling visit, follow-up visits, for making sure that there is a discharge, the standard post-discharge care steps, right? For example, if a diabetic patient is being discharged from a hospital, you may want them to follow a certain diet or a certain, uh, you know, post-discharge care regimen, right? Uh, you would still want to uh, automate that process because for a certain demographic of a certain diabetic patient going through a certain medication, you exactly know what are the standard processes that they, standard discharge care, post-discharge care processes that they need to follow. Again, a candidate for RPA. Moving on to the uh, financial side of the healthcare world where, you know, you want to maintain claims, validate claims, education, looking at your AR cycles, you know, there are standard uh, claim denial reasons. So you could uh, basically, again, automate those processes. And I would again say that maybe processes like education or maybe the denials and appeals may require attended bots versus unattended bots. That is a decision you can take based on how complex or how simple your uh, claims education workflow is. Moving on to some more uh, use cases on the next slide, which basically talk about supply chain management, some use cases around, uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry, uh, maintaining certain standard reports and dashboards. So if you can move to the next slide, it actually talks about reports and dashboards, which are standard reports, uh, you know, automating certain audit reports generation. Uh, maybe, again, again, right, in context of uh, life sciences, uh, Maybe, you know, managing the clinical and medical writing, site initiation, initiation document, pharmacovigilance, uh, you know, uh, having those standard clinical trial uh, registration information, all of that can be automated. Similarly, in the supply chain context, you know, processing of the orders, sourcing and procurement, right, all of that process is standard. 
and you can automate it to some level. From a data management perspective, that's that's probably the most challenging area where, you know, so there are so to give you an example, right? Uh, there are a lot of these standard quality measure reporting that you need to do on macro measures or meaningful use measures, right? Or certain FDA uh, submissions. So to a level where you know the providers uh, have already figured out that this is a compliance and non-compliance report they need to submit, the process post that on to posting that data on CMS or ONC can be automated because that data is not going to change. And it's a standard process. And you know, tech organizations can actually support the providers and payers to submit that data automatically, uh, you know, through RPA bots. And you know, they can receive. I mean, they can achieve optimization in terms of for you know, reducing the uh, you know, reducing the uh, the the effort that a provider or payer has to take to actually do all of those submissions. So, uh, so that's that's you know in some ways we wanted to cover up all the uh, you know RPA related use cases and Catherine actually has a very interesting case study that she would like to cover uh, where uh, you know it's a medical device case study and you know I will request uh, Catherine to actually talk about uh, that case study it's a very interesting uh, implementation that they had done over to you Catherine. Thank you Manisha that was an excellent overview of all the opportunities to automate within the. Uh, healthcare industry. So this is a particular medical device case study where, in fact, the um, trying to actually integrate the patient with the uh, inventory and with the hospital system and also within the invoice and back office. So this um, was basic, basically automated the pre-registration uh, shipping of a medical device and um, it's um, uh, uh, putting together the actual service itself that monitoring um, this cardiac device. Now, this, uh, this process automated uh, 50 processes. It saved over $240,000 annual, uh, annually, and it had produced zero errors. And if there was any errors, it was actually handled by an individual. So basically what happens here is that the, uh, there is a pre-registration form and a bot will monitor an email and so the PDF comes in into a specific email box that the, that the automation system monitors. Once that comes in, it scans that information, enters it in and sends the inventory team the new uh, PDF. Once the inventory team uh, receives that re registration form, they then um, have to uh, initiate a consignment agreement and they forward it to the customer for acceptance. So that signature, that acceptance has to happen, and once it does, it gets loaded into their um, into their system, and and then once that uh, the billing asset tool uh, that triggers um, the actual integration within their SAP. So the inventory system um, is identified. It downloads the data file every oh, uh, five to ten times a week and produces an invoice out of that. So, and then also the um, confirmation is triggers a bot to monitor the actual unit itself and um, it supports the portal and loads the transmission summaries into a database, both for billing because this is actually um, billed on an annual basis um, for the, uh, based on the customer or the patient using it. And then uh, that can com be completed at the end of each quarter. So it actually integrates the entire cycle associated with that particular cardiac device. And in addition, it actually provides and downloads the current inventory data um, from the company's SAP system and as it allows the regional sales team to understand and being notified of inventories within the region. So it actually connects the entire ecosystem and enables that patient to have an end-to-end -end optimal solution for one, both they get better care, they get faster uh, initiation of their actual service and their device itself, and then the invoice process is done very efficiently to reduce their uh, cycle time and be able to improve cash flow. So that's sort of a, an example of a simple RPA process that was implemented across 50 different processes it's a, and, and also being able to save significant money per year. So I welcome any questions that you might have about other use cases and I'll also hand it over to Manisha. So thank you, Manisha. Thank you, Catherine. So again, yeah, we have a poll question for the audience on, you know, where do you think RPA is most applicable in healthcare? So, uh, heavy cycle management, claims, billing, billing denials, uh, whether it's patient registration and scheduling, data management, uh, or any other processes where you think it's most applicable. And, you know, again, I would 
completely agree that RCM, you know, the whole revenue cycle management is is the way to go. And uh, you know that that in fact, you know, a lot of the lot of our participants are actually uh, vouching for that. That that is definitely an area where you know you see the applicability of RPA the most, at least for few of the up, few years. All right, so uh, you know, let's move on to the next slide where. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's what I was talking about, right? That our, uh, RCM is probably the most uh, popular space where RPA is definitely going to make a headway. So, uh, you know, what I would like to cover next uh, is that given that you have now identified or you've understood how how to identify uh, RPA candidates, how do you go about you know, what are the key considerations or factors that you should think of when you want to start adopting uh, and uh, start ad ad adopting and implementing RPA? So obviously, you need to first identify the business case. And you know, I actually covered uh, that in length on the previous slide where I said on how do you identify what should be a long-term objective? Uh, you know, what should be your RPA suitability? What should be the uh, you know use case based on decision making versus uh, you know unstructured data or electronic data and so on and so forth, right? So once you've identified the business case, you need to uh, you know start thinking about uh, and once you are convinced that there's definitely an ROI, you need to start thinking about an approach on uh, you know on what how how would you want to go about implementing this? So there are a lot of vendors in the market uh, which actually uh, you know. Uh, they, they basically help you uh, with uh, dedicated bots. So they, they have a f framework, they will have dedicated bots, and those tools are basically easy to implement uh, within, your, uh, within your business process. So what you would really do is you would uh, you know, look at different vendors, look at what is uh, more applicable to you. And I have a detailed slide just on how do you do the tool selection coming up. So for now, I'll just limit my uh, you know, uh, presentation to how you, you need to assess a vendor, look at which vendor is performing better, and then go big bang on introducing the RP efficiencies. Uh, then is when, you know, once you identify what is the long-term prospect of the process, is the process going to change too often or has too many exceptions, uh, thinking about scalability, thinking about your existing technology, thinking about data availability in the process, you know, are there any manual bottlenecks? Based on that, you would identify whether you want an attended bot versus an unattended bot. And once you've selected your vendor, right, the way we would recommend you to implement this is, uh, you know, identify one or two processes, maybe, uh, you know, medium-sized processes, implement the bot for that first, see the ROI, see how you're going to manage the bot, and then you go big bang on, you know, implementing a lot of your other processes. And the beauty of the bots is that you could actually use one bot and uh, for multiple processes. So it's not that it's always a one-to-one -one mapping that I have 100 processes, am I going to require 100 bots? That may not be always true. There could be scenarios where one bot could actually manage multiple processes. So you need to make those decisions. And then, uh, you know, who are the business users who are going to be impacted uh, by this uh, automation? And, uh, you know, in terms of usability, functionality, the outcome that you're going to see, uh, you need to do that analysis. And that's it. Then you just, you know, uh, identify the use cases. Uh, you know, uh, implement one or two use cases and then go big bang on implementing uh, your larger processes. And once you've done that, it's very really important that you start managing and governing those bots because there could be scenarios where in, in productions you may see some unforeseen errors, uh, you may see some unexpected errors, and you would want to tweak the bots uh, based on any new scenarios that pop up. So it's very important that you are thinking, while you're thinking of developing the bots and deploying the bots, it's very important that the post-production or the post-deployment uh, process or phase is thought through. So you would have to manage and govern the bots after you've implemented them. So uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, so this is what I was, there was a small bullet on the previous slide which spoke about, uh, you know, identifying the vendors uh, which needed uh, to be, uh, which, which you need to partner with for implementing RPA. So 
again, there are a lot of, uh, you know, tools in the market today uh, which have shown success, specifically with banking industry. As you can see, you know, in the healthcare, it's still picking up. Uh, life sciences definitely matured, and uh, from the healthcare perspective, it's still picking up, and, you know, claims, RCM definitely be, seems to be the popular uh, category where RP can be applied. But how do you think, what, what do you, how do you, what, what kind of process or thought process will you have to select the right tool for implementation? So it depends first on the usability, right, on uh, the ease of designing the bot, what kind of GUI is available for you, how much of, see RPAs are, or the, another advantage that you have with RPA is that it gives you a code-free experience. So you really don't have to write a lot of manual code when you are implementing bots. And that's when you, know, you think of implementing the third-party tools. So look at, uh, based on your processes, based on your problem statement, identify which, which, which tool is giving you ease of implementation, ease of customization, scalable, you know, uh, capability to manage high volume, you know, uh, from a security perspective. So in context of healthcare, the good news is all the top two, top three to four uh, RPA tools or RPA vendors are HIPAA compliant. So while uh, we would recommend you to make sure that these tools, one, they are HIPAA compliant, two, they're easy to be implemented within your security ecosystem so that while you're automating processes specifically which are managing PHI data, there is no uh, security leak or any non-compliance from HIPAA perspective. That's very, very important when you're implement, implementing RP tools. Again, technology compatibility. So looking at your existing framework, existing tech stack, what is making more sense, reliability, host uh, implementation support that you may, may be getting from them, how customizable it is, how easily deployed can the tool be, what kind of ROI am I getting, right? So you also have to think of license fees when you are partnering with third-party tools. So you have setup cost, you have license fee, which is the upfront uh, cost that you are putting in. So you need to measure that vis-a-vis -vis your ROI that you're going to get. So all of those considerations need to be, uh, you know, thought through while you are selecting a RP tool. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, you know, so once you've identified the tool, once you've, you know, know what kind of business processes you want to implement, right, uh, it's, not a, it's not a rosy path. You will face challenges in, in, in terms of uh, convincing your organization that why RPA is required. In fact, I did face that problem within our organization also. So, uh, you know, um, and I would just uh, request the moderator to move to the next slide. Uh, this is, you know, slide number 24. Thank you very much. So, uh, as I was saying, right, it's important that you define the right use cases, but you also have to consider that in a lot of these legacy systems today, right, they, they, they are implemented in silos, and uh, that could be one of the reason, one of the areas where you would face a technology challenge to implement RPA, okay? Uh, again, non-standardized processes, uh, you know, uh, it, it's very challenging today, at least today, that, you know, uh, the non-standardized processes uh, could be a candidate for RPA. Again, I'm not saying uh, that you cannot implement it, but it's definitely a complex area. Similarly, unstructured data, very similar to non-standard process processes, right, that it's uh, initially, at least, you know, if you're starting, if you're a new organization, Please look at structured data. Please look at standardized processes. And once you develop a certain level of maturity, you can definitely consider implementing RPA for non-standardized processes, uh, for unstructured data provided you know that uh, you may not need a lot of manual intervention. Uh, obviously, you face a lot of issues, uh, you know, mostly from your operations team in terms of, you know, buying in that, you know, we need an RPA process, we need to automate certain processes, right? So that conflict will always be there. And again, right, it's up to organizations on how do you resolve the conflict, how do you convince your uh, team that, you know, we can do better things and, you know, let's just automate repeatable processes, let's just automate processes which do not require human intelligence, right? And then obviously security. So the security, I, I touched base on it on the previous slide as well, right? 
a lot of organizations shy away uh, from automating any processes because they are worried about phi so that would be a challenge or a pushback that you would hear from organizations but again right as i said most of these popular tools are hipaa compliant and organizations would definitely have their own hipaa compliance processes and policies in place so while you're implementing the boards the way you overcome this challenge is first of all make sure that you do your enough checks and balances in terms of choosing the vendor and asking them the right question in terms of hipaa compliance uh, and then obviously making sure that there is feasibility in terms of extending your existing security uh, policies and procedures so uh, you know again so that's that's where you know you would want to overcome all the challenges and we have uh a poll question coming up so uh what do you think is the most important or you know most significant roadblock in rpa implementation so you know so i i just explain some challenges uh you know from our perspective but we would you know love to hear it from the audience right on what do you see see as the roadblock so whether it's unknown tools uh whether it's uh, you know uncertain roi unable to find the right processes unable to implement the digital workflows right so a lot of those options are available for you and we would request you to share your perspective as well because as i said right it's it's still maturing in healthcare and we would love to hear it from the audience on what do you think are the most important or significant roadblocks so uh yeah i'll just give you a minute or two to actually respond and then we'll move on to the next slide so almost you know 34% uh, you know of the audience is saying that is the manual process is creating the bottlenecks uh, and uh, you know it's about convincing the operations team that you know it's important that you automate these processes uh, while obviously the uncertain ro and cost uh, and unknown tools uh, you know are definitely few more uh, significant roadblocks so with that you know what i would like to cover uh, in the next section is what is city state doing in context of you know uh, providing expertise to our uh, customers our existing customers and you know whoever is looking at implementing rpa so today uh, and again you know we are early adopters of rpa in in healthcare context and you know uh, given that we understand the healthcare domain very well right it just helps us to uh, in some ways you know bridging the gap between the domain the business processes and you know how do you then strategize uh, your rpa uh, rpa consideration your rpa plan right so we already have certified so all these tools right uh, which are available in the market also provide certification and that helps you to make sure that you have in house expertise when you have to manage these bots so we already have certified individuals within the company uh, you know and automation has been a focus any which way for us and uh, the way we typically engage with our customers is right that we first help them identify what the process is where is it that you want to do your roi uh, in terms of implementing the processes do you really see any kind of cost savings if not then you know it does not make sense so we do that assessment then we de develop the bots then we deploy the bots um we identify whether uh, you need attended bots unattended bots uh any intelligent uh, bot development that you need to do customization that you would want to do and once we do that we actually automate those deployments uh, again leveraging our devops practice and then we manage uh, the bots we also give them uh, give our customers some uh, you know kpi some dashboards some reports which would make them feel comfortable and they will also get a view insight into what kind of cost savings uh, you know what kind of roi are they really seeing in terms of the implementation and you know just in the interest of time right what i would request uh, the moderator is let's just move on to the case studies i do have some child slides talking about consulting in detail talking about development but you know what would be in, uh, really interesting for our users would be right to actually you know talk about the case study which is on slide number 13 33 so what we've done for one of our customers is right and they are an rcm uh, customer 
you know, they, they are a leading provider of revenue cycle services and physician advisory services. Today, we have, you know, implemented um, at least, uh, you know, uh, 60 to 70 processes of theirs. We have automated those processes. So we started with a feasibility study uh, on the use of RPA in their context, and then we, start, we have created unattended bots for them uh, to resolve a lot of common billing errors and, uh, you know, payment posting processes. And now we are implementing monitoring systems to capture the performance improvement. And we're already seeing that so the manual process of fetching the claims with errors from the database, verifying the application, re rectifying the errors, and sending it for further processing, right? So the whole process today is automated. And now there is zero uh, uh, manual intervention. The customer is already seeing 80% reduction in the execution time. They're able to respond better to their uh, stakeholders in terms of any kind of claim queries. So there's enough, uh, you know, they've, they've, up, they've upped their patient engagement in some ways, and we've also verified the accuracy of, you know, this whole process that we've automated for them. So, you know, as I said, the reduction in the execution time in some ways directly leads to patient engagement and patient satisfaction so that, you know, the patients exactly know why the claim failed or denied, what are the errors if they need to be fixed, and, you know, then send for further processing. It is also another stakeholder that you cater to. So all your medical coding um, staff, right, uh, there could be scenarios where they've entered some incorrect data, and again, right, the claim got denied. But the moment you have a process in place which is actually fetching all the errors and already letting them know what their problem is, right, it just increases the process efficiency. Moving on to the next case study, uh, again, for one of our technology customers, uh, you know, we started with the feasibility analyses and we've deployed, uh, you know, a, a, a attended bot for them to actually, uh, so this is more of internal uh, technology process that we have, uh, you know, uh, automated rather than a business process. So, you know, the whole code deployment, the loading of the data and the reconciliation of the data, right? We've actually implemented bots to do that. So we, we, we automated the process uh, of loading the data and reconciling the data, and then we've done a complete sanity testing of this. Uh, we've reduced, uh, you know, the, the FT or the manual intervention to 50%. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's an attended board, so obviously there is some manual intervention required. Overall, we have reduced it to 50% with 40% reduction in execution time and 100% accuracy, accuracy, and obviously the, the whole process of deployment and data reconciliation has improved. So with that, we have the last, uh, I think, uh, poll question for the day, and then we'll summarize and we'll be open to any questions from the audience. So the last poll question, who do you think is the most help needed from an RPA? Where do you think is the most help needed from an RPA expert, right? Uh, whether it's assessing the eligible RPA candidates or RPA readiness or the whole board development and management process, the technology expertise, or you know, managing and monitoring the ROI and the other support. So we are already seeing some responses, and you know, as expected, uh, you know, again, aligning to our thought process. Today, the organizations are still maturing, and they would first really, really need help in terms of consulting and you know, identifying the most eligible processes even before they think of actually deploying and, you know, developing developing and deploying RPA in their health system. So bang on, I mean, it just makes sense that you first take baby steps, identify the use cases, identify the processes, and then go big bang in implementing it. So just to summarize, uh, you know, the whole, I hope this was a useful and informative session for the audience, right? Uh, what we're really seeing is that RPA is rapidly growing. It's catching interest in the healthcare space. Uh, obviously, when you're implementing an RPA, the success lies in careful selection of the processes, the tools, and what kind of uh, performance metrics that you would want to look at. Uh, obviously, the process that you are identifying should be repeatable. Uh, it should be a stable process, not, you know, requiring a lot of changes or modifications frequently. 
uh, with well-defined inputs, structured inputs, electronic inputs to be preferred, at least to start with. And, you know, obviously it differs from test automation. So this is a very common problem that we have seen or a confusion that we have seen. A lot of times organizations get confused between test automation and RPA, right? They are really, really different capabilities and they are existing for different needs, right? So, uh, again, CTS Tech, in some ways, as I said, you know, we've, we've already the early adopters in terms of helping our organizations to implement this. And, you know, we're happy to help you in case if you need any further guidance uh, from us. So with that, uh, you know, Bill, I'll pass it on to you. Uh, you know, if the audience has, if the participants have any questions to ask, then, you know, we'll be have, Kathleen and I will be happy to answer them. Thank you both for a wonderful presentation. I want to first remind everyone that you can continue to submit questions using the Ask a Question panel on your screen. So, for our first question, can AI be integrated with RPA? Hi, yes, this is Catherine. Um, yes, it can. We have seen that occur <clears throat> consistently in large organizations or even smaller ones that are trying to do uh, work on creating uh, insights and innovations for uh, drug discovery as well as for being able to do revenue cycle, revenue cycle management and claims processing. Um, I think that based on the audience today, that they're, it's probably better to focus on the areas they see their, their immediate opportunities and um, start simple, start where you're going to get an immediate ROI, but know that there is a roadmap to integrate into your AI systems, and Automation Anywhere supports that with our IQBot and also with the way our enterprise system works. Very good. Our next question. In which area of healthcare do you think RPA is seeing the most growth? So, uh, you know, I'll take that question. So, I think we already answered that, you know, uh, during the course of the presentation. Uh, in my opinion, uh, you know, revenue cycle management systems are definitely seen uh, as the early adopters in context of, uh, you know, RPA implementation purely because of obviously. There are financial transactions involved. Uh, you know, there are a lot of stakeholders involved when it comes to RCM systems, be it providers, patients, payers, right? So it's definitely, uh, you know, uh, important for all of these stakeholders to get uh, better output, better satisfaction and engagement. And definitely, you know, there are a lot of repeatable processes within RCM which are a candidate for automation. Excellent. Uh, we have another question from the audience. Are there any other methods for doing RPA instead of going for market tools? So, uh, so far, we've, you know, our recommendation would be to go for third-party tools. Uh, you know, definitely you could implement your own bot. Uh, I mean, it's in some ways an umbrella of artificial intelligence, right? So you could def definitely develop your own bots, but, you know, it beats the purpose. So RPA tools, you know, in some ways provide you code-free experience. Uh, the management of the bots, the governance of the bots, right? A lot of that is, uh, you know, a lot of that effort is reduced the moment you go for these third-party aggregators. So my recommendation would be, Go for these tools until you develop a certain maturity and you would want to do anything ground up. Very good. Uh, our next question. What is the difference between automation implementation and RPA implementation? All right. So, yeah, Catherine, you want to take that up? Yeah, so I think that RPA is a particular tool within the automation uh, ecosystem. So if you're looking at uh, doing task-oriented roles where you're basically uh, taking structured data from one place to another or it's a very highly structured manual task and you want to replace that with a software bot, that's the RPA piece. Automation is more expansive. It incorporates integration with um, intelligent automation when, in fact, you might be using something like IQBot or you might be doing 
doing some work with our um, analysis tools or you're integrating with other systems. So it's a, a basically a scaling and also a function coverage in terms of the way the process is automating, automated and the tools that you're integrating with. Hopefully that answers it for you. Excellent. Our next question. What is and has been the biggest roadblock for providers entering and using RPA tools? Okay, uh, Kathleen, I'll take that up. So, uh, see the biggest roadblock, not only just for providers, but other stakeholders like peers is, right, that if I am automating something, and it's, it's, it's not RPA, but in general, right, any kind of technology advancement, uh, you know, it's, it's generally, you would see an initial pushback from provider stakeholders. So uh, the, the, the most important worry in their mind is what about my data? What about my data security? I'm going to implement something. Is this going to be, uh, you know, out of my my ecosystem, my environments, right? How do I make sure that I have enough control over enough control and governance over the uh, the the technology that I'm going to adopt to, whether it's moving my systems on cloud, whether it's implementing any kind of automation in context of RPA, whether it's about doing any kind of other artificial intelligence operationalization, right? So the most common worry, I would say, is data security. And the second worry would be whether I have enough control uh, to make sure and take decisions on uh, governing these uh, and monitoring these uh, automations. Okay. Yeah, and just... Uh... Yeah, Catherine, you want to add to that? Uh, I was just saying that the, basically um, they need to access and manage the security, but they basically ensure the bots are used in a manner compliant with regulations and internal business processes. Uh, the bots yes. don't hold the data, so you, if you're on-prem um, and you're using it with uh, transferring of information, basically you just need to ensure that it's in, uh, compliant. And we have uh, ways of enabling that. We have large uh, companies that are deploying this, so we're more than happy, help, we're more than happy to work with such as Check and others to actually assure that you're um, overcoming these barriers. Okay, our next question. How can we measure the performance in ROI? Okay, so uh, let, me, let me take a you know, attempt at this and maybe Catherine, you can help me. So sure. there is no standard way of measure, sorry, okay. There's no standard way of measuring the performance in ROI, right? So. This, this, this in some ways, obviously the tools provide standard dashboards and reports where you can see the cost savings, but uh, internally, right, when your, your RPA team, right, it consists of uh, certified RPA professionals, uh, some technology experts, you know, uh, also automation uh, experts, right, who are constantly measuring the manual process versus the efficiency that you have achieved out after you have implemented the bots, right? So you would have to have customized uh, reporting in place in order to manage and monitor the performance purely because every use case, depending on the organization's strength, depending on the organization's existing uh, manual strength, right, uh, the whole performance and ROI would be different, right? And a uh, Catherine, I'm not sure if uh, automation yeah. provides a ROI calculator. Uh, yeah. But you could you could you could highlight that. But again, you definitely yeah. need to have your customized uh, monitoring in place to uh, to to look at your performance and ROI. Right, exactly. This is a very important area, and what we do is we take the inputs from your system. We have specific questions that we ask and work with partners to acquire the information into an ROI calculator or business analyst tool that helps you to get assessment. We also identify other criteria that, are, that your in business or your hospital or your organization is looking to actually meet, so there's more criteria than the, just the cost savings, and so there's a, you can actually see the ROI from many different levels. So, um, yeah, we work with with partners and you to to deliver that ROI uh, calculation. Okay, at this time we have to wrap up. Thank you to both our speakers for such a wonderful presentation today. 
I would like to invite our audience to complete the evaluation at the conclusion of today's event and share your thoughts with us. As a reminder, today's session will be available on demand for one year through the HIMSS Learning Center. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.